Uh, my name is Petros Spathopoulos. I'm the head of research at Norton LifeLock. Uh, as, as a leaders in consumer uh, security and privacy, we have been researching uh, all kinds of things. But today I'm going to talk about online privacy. And uh, we've done a lot of work for many, many years. Our first publication on this was uh, more than 10 years ago. And um, today I will share with you specifically some of our most recent findings relating to web privacy and, and tracking. Right. And, and I'm uh, grateful to uh, Amira and Anshu because they, they brought up some uh, very important points that make the perfect segue um, for me to, to go into this talk. So uh, having said that, uh, this is this is a, a screenshot from a tool that that we built at some point uh, where we we wanted to analyze what's happening behind the scenes when you visit a website. This is from a particular uh, a very uh, popular website online uh, community that I you know I'm, I'm I'm going to keep anonymous for for now. But the point is that when you load the homepage of this community, right? This is what happens behind the scenes. And, and I'm, I'm sure that most people don't realize in many cases, not even the website administrators realize there's a bunch of entities that are uh, involved. These red cookies that you see here are cookies that contain personally uh, identifiable information. In other words, things that can identify you uniquely online. So you can see that the uh, ecosystem is, is pretty, um, pretty intense, pretty, pretty uh, complex. And we wanted to sort of demystify what's happening behind the scenes because uh, it's definitely very hard for consumers to understand this and follow it. So the question that we asked ourselves was, do we know who is watching us online? So in other words, do we know what are all these entities that are being involved in setting cookies and doing all these things? So we started from, from the basics. Let's take an example. So you try to load a website, let's say sports.com, and you expect that this website will load some resources, the web page itself, for instance, the, the front page. So sports.com does that, but it turns out that it also is loading a number of other things. It's, it's loading media, it's loading uh, third-party uh, material and so on. And in the end, you end up having all of these resources and some of those resources are loading their own resources and so on. You, you end up having all of these resources loaded on your browser and you observe that uh, a bunch of cookies have been set on your browser, but you don't really understand what happened in between. You, you, you just wanted to go to sports.com and suddenly all of, this, all of these things have happened. So we wanted to first understand what is this flow? What, how, how do these things come to go from you know, wanting to go to a page to, to having all of these things, things set in your browser? So we started looking and, uh, and, and understanding how all of these things are connected. So we wanted to answer questions like, you know, who is the initiator of the loading and what are the intermediaries that are involved? And at the end of the day, who is the executor? Who's writing these cookies and who's actually doing the, um, the, the tracking in, in this case? And then <clears throat> we know that in some cases, some, some of, the, uh, of these uh, resources and the uh, accompanying cookies are actually being loaded by, by the resource itself, right? And in some of these cases, um, uh, we, we, we may call these first party cookies if they're, if they're loaded from sports.com itself, right? And then in, in, in the process, we also know that one or multiple intermediaries may also create their own resources and therefore create their own cookies that are being set on your browser. And then finally, we have the, uh, the people who are the entities that are actually writing their own sort of cookies for, for each of these resources. So, so this is one part of the, uh, of the process. But then as we were doing this research, we observed another phenomenon that we reported and, and kind of had the, the privilege of, of kind of naming. And the name we gave it was uh, cookie ghostwriting. So what happens with cookie ghostwriting is basically you have a third party that is writing a cookie on your browser and it's doing that in a kind of concealed manner. It's doing it, it's, it's basically in start, instructing the, the main website, sports.com in the case, in this case, the, the first party, to write the cookie on its behalf. And, and that kind of conceals it a little bit and you don't really understand how this got to be created, but you have to do some serious digging to do that. And in this case, you end up having a third party monitor certain things and, and, and track certain things without immediately realizing that it is uh, a, a third party. 
And then finally, just because this wasn't complex enough, we have a lot of cookie sharing. So behind the scenes and not on the, on the page, not uh, with the intention of sports.com necessarily, there's a lot of cooking sharing, cookies sharing taking place among all these entities that are being involved. So when you have a cookie creation, so far, you know, very briefly and at a very high level, I've I've mentioned a few things. We have first party creators, and those are typically fine. It's it's the cookies that the website itself is setting so that you can log in more easily and it remembers your username or whatever not. We have third party cookie creators, which is uh, from entities that the 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 website is co uh, collaborating with or side loading, and those are created from these third part parties. And then finally, we have this kind of more advanced uh, ghostwriting type of of uh, cookies that are being uh, uh, written on your browser, right? So the, 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 the concept of cookie ghostwriting, as I said, is new. It's something that we discovered along the way and analyzed very deeply. And I wanted to kind of uh, revisit it so that uh, I, I kind of give you a more uh, specific example and for people to understand. So let's imagine we have, and this is a real example. I'm not, um, it's not a hypothetical. We, it's one of the many websites that we saw this, uh, where we saw this happening. So let's imagine that you have a, a uh, photo sharing uh, uh, application, online application, and the, uh, the, there's a third party that's being employed by the, by the service as, as a digital trust service or whatnot. And that service wants to create a cookie, but they decide to create it in such a way in collaboration with the, the first party, such that in the end, it appears as, as if the, the original website created it. But in fact, all the data that uh, are being tracked by this cookie goes to the, um, to the third party. So, so this is something we really need to keep an eye out for because it, it kind of demonstrates the evolution of the tracking ecosystem, right? So for this study, which actually you can go in and, uh, and read in full detail in, uh, in our paper that, that is going to be published soon, but it's online for people to, uh, to enjoy, we analyzed more than 138 million cookies. Uh, we used our custom infrastructure to do that, and we were able to answer some of these questions and extract some um, uh, insights that, that I'm going to share with you uh, right away. So first of all, we confirmed the roles and the actors, right? The, the creators is the most common role between prevalent actors. Uh, uh, there are uh, other actors that rarely create, but often act as senders and receivers. So, so this is more in the, uh, in the cookie sharing uh, phase of, of, the, uh, of the chain. And like I said, this can all be just by loading the homepage, right? It's, it doesn't, it's not some complicated interaction. And then um, uh, many, many other entities behave as, as intermediaries uh, in both the creation and the sharing chains. So, so these are the, the, the primary roles. There, there are a few other roles as well, as well, but these are the primary actors that we observed. So when we're looking at the numbers, uh, we are seeing that ghosted cookies and, and third-party cookies, uh, if we analyze the distributions, are the most prevalent ones right now. Uh, there's obviously a good uh, amount of first party cookies as well, but we see a lot of ghosted and third party cookies. Now, we, if we look at the actual numbers of how many of those cookies are being created on websites, we see that there's a lot of first party, party cookies, which makes sense because websites want to have their own control over preferences of the users and whatever not. And that third party cookies and ghosted cookies are, are almost the same in, in terms of, of numbers. But um, we, we saw that websites that create third party cookies or ghosted cookies, they create more than one. On average, they do they create about three, right? So, so those are very, very uh, popular in, as, as techniques to, to uh, track people online. Let's look at some other uh, interesting questions. So what is the real impact for, of web tracking on, on users, on consumers? So we wanted to ask questions like, how many trackers do users encounter and how fast do they encounter them? And you know, what are the correlations we're seeing about uh, visited websites and, and trackers and so on? And also, most importantly, what do trackers know? Do they know what websites we visit? Do you, do you know, do they know how much, um, uh, do we can we understand how much this changes within uh, when we have cooperation among trackers and 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 so on? 
So I'll give you a, a brief preview of some of our findings. As I said, the, um, the detailed results are, are uh, mentioned in our paper. So uh, intermediaries, which is kind of an interesting concept because intermediaries are, are uh, players, are actors that we don't expect in an interaction. We, you know, when I go to sports.com, I expect to interact with sports.com. I wouldn't necessarily expect that other entities will see what I'm doing there. So during the creation chains, in 62% 60, of the creation chains, uh, cookie creation chains, and 48% of the sharing chains, we see at least one intermediary. So this basically means that in more than half the cases that where we interact online and there's cookie involved, either creation of cookies or sharing of cookies, there's always at least one uh, intermediary um, that's observing the, the, uh, the interaction. Similarly, on websites, almost 43% of the websites that we analyzed during the study involved at least three intermediaries in, in the uh, uh, in the transactions that that they were doing with with the user, that's a pretty high number, right? So you have three outside entities that are in the uh, flow of of uh, of creating the uh, cookies or sharing cookies and so on, and at forty three percent of of the websites. Let's look at something else by the numbers, right? So we saw that one hundred and seventy seven tracking entities were encountered on average since just one week of browsing. So basically, we simulated one week of browsing based on data, and we saw that in just one week, you're, we're seeing, seeing 177 tracking entities. And, and at this point, I want to point out that by tracking entities, we don't mean specific trackers. We mean companies that may have many subsidiaries that are actually uh, doing tracking. So we group those and count them. So if we were going to count individual trackers, it would be a lot more. And you can see the rest of the numbers here, like 50% of them in just two hours, compounded by data sharing. Data sharing adds about 5% if, if we take data sharing into account. And obviously, I give a few more numbers uh, so that you can understand kind of the, uh, the, the dimensions of the problem. And at the end of the day, as I said, we, we saw that if we were going to group tracking entities and, and, uh, and count them, we see more than uh, 6,300 of those. And what's interesting, if, if we dig, for, dig further, we'll see that certain sensitive categories that people may be um, particularly uh, sensitive about, like you know their political views or the legal views and so on, are, um, are actually uh, treated with preference by different tracking tracking entities. Not all tracking entities like to uh, see the same stuff. So for instance, I'm calling out Facebook here, but there's uh, information on all tracking entities. Facebook covers 60% of political websites and 50% of health categories. Finally, we observe, we observe the security paradox. So the security paradox here means that websites that we saw containing uh, bad stuff like malicious data, botnets, spam, and so on, they, uh, and this is uh, denoted by the risk score, um, they didn't uh, uh, employ as many trackers. And, you know, that's because the, the website was, you know, had didn't have a, a reason to track you there. They, they have other malicious uh, goals that are trying to achieve. Now, the ecosystem turns out to be quite well connected. So this graph shows you uh, the um, relationship between the different uh, major trackers. And these relationships are either sharing of data or the one loading the other. So, so it's a pretty uh, tight graph there. They, they, there's the, the level of collaboration among trackers is, is quite significant. And as I said, that uh, amplifies the amount of tracking that's happening. But here are a few numbers just to answer the question. Uh, and, and we've kind of uh, isolated to the top trackers here. So for instance, Google can know up to 63% of your history and 72% of the websites you visit for a very, very, very wide uh, range of users, almost all of the users, right? And so on and so forth. So by by uh, by deploying the same trackers and doing data sharing among among different websites, it's very easy for the tracking companies to infer the the things, the websites that you go to, uh, and and infer the uh, your your browsing habits, right? So 
just to uh, uh, share a few final thoughts about the road ahead, the tracking ecosystem gets smart and smarter. We, we see that there are new techniques that are being used, and I expect that there will be more and more uh, being deployed soon. Uh, it's an ongoing area of research uh, for all of us, and especially uh, my team at Norton LifeLock. We, um, we have more information and details available on our website. And as I said, you know, we've published papers that you can find online. But the bottom line is that all of this is, is, a, is very complex. It's very complex for consumers to follow. They definitely need assistance in this kind of uh, journey online. But it's also very hard for businesses to understand. Like you sign up for something that's uh, going to enable your business to thrive. And suddenly this includes all kinds of other things and intermediaries. And suddenly your website uh, is, is kind of a tracking mess. Now, on, on, the, on the more, uh, let's say, optimistic front, there are things that we can do. There are tools that can help consumers while we sort this out because it's, it's really difficult for them to do it on their own. I'm going to call out um, uh, Norton Antitrack, which is something that uh, we put out, but of course there are uh, other options as well. Uh, and, and they provide um, quite good protection in some cases against some of these threats. And with that, uh, I'll pause here and uh, take uh, give the microphone back to the moderator.